Thanks uh, for a very nice introduction. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have joined this, this session and, and I'm the panelist in this morning session, but I don't feel much nervous like this afternoon. <laughs> Maybe because there are some challenges that I have to face. One thing is because uh, I'm not have much experience in this field. I'm not so keen on in terms of quality assurance and also as Anja just said, I have uh, only one year uh, joining with the Chrono plan. But anyway, I will do my best. And one of another challenge is that you did give me this uh, panel in the afternoon, you know. So after the meal directly, I know that everyone may have to face a lot of difficulties, you know, stay awake during my presentation, so please forgive me. <laughs> Okay, um, I think um, first of all, before I start my presentation, I wanted to give a credit to my boss, uh, Dr. Benjamin Reyes, because he's the one who, um, uh, actually I could say that he, he guide me, you know, he briefed me on how to present on behalf of the Colombo plan. And also during this time, uh, we are facing the absence of our project director on GCCC. So I myself, as a director of the uh, drug rescue program, will do on on uh, on behalf of the Colombo plan. So, well, uh, talking about what exactly is the professional credentialing and um, the role of the Colombo plan. Uh, through this uh, GCCC or Global um, Certification and Credential Center. Let me go through slide. Okay. So um, to start up this um, topic, I would like to give you, um, well, I may say that actually in my understanding and in everyone's understanding is uh, every patient, you know, in every hospital, um, we are entitled to the best care as much as possible from, from, the, from the treatment centers or from, from any hospital care. But uh, in that case, you know, um, the health system itself, they should reach something like, uh, what do we call it, the quality standard as well. So in order to uh, give us with the quality care and the good outcome after they have been, we have been treated. So, um, the first bullet point, it's about the, um, the contribution of the WHO. At that time, uh, it's more than 200 experts from all the WHO contributed to the um, comprehensive health labor market framework and so-called the universal health coverage. And then after that, the synthesis paper uh, was published in 2015 in fe February to comprise an initial version of the global strategy. Uh, talking about the global strategy in terms of health, um, it's all about the services delivery priorities from my understanding. And it's covered a range of uh, strategy to be developed by the WHO and United Nations. But overall, the goal is to ensure quality in health service delivery and the demand for need to e elevate health, human resource, competence, and skill in performing their functions. This is the overall goal. And it should be um, entailed with um, the improvement of health, social, economic development outcome, and at the same time, to qualify the health workforce and uh, with the ultimate goal of having the effective policy at the national regional and global level. Um, so this, this framework, it's open the gateway for quality assurance in health services. And as I said, um, including the skill in performance, the functions. So uh, what is credentialing actually? Um, what, most of the time, you know, the credentialing, certification, and accreditation, uh, they are used, um, I mean, the words are commonly used uh, from time to time. Like, in, in some countries, they use certification, some countries use accreditation, and some countries also use credentialing. And sometimes it's also mean differently in, in many countries, you know. But uh, all these things, you know, in order to assure the competent health manpower, 
uh, a system needs to be developed. And at the same time, certification me mechanism is also need to be developed. Because uh, the possession of the credential is not only to prove the capacity of individual, but um, it's also showing, reflecting that government, community, and employer have um, the knowledge and experience enough to carry out the task uh, and to perform the specific job. So I mean that both of these terms, you know, they define the, what we call, they need a higher levels of competence. Uh, this one, I try to um, make a differences between certification and credentialing. Uh, a certified pers personnel is um, from what I have been brief, you know, and I try to extract and explain you further, uh, is that a cert certified personnel is somebody who has finished a course, uh, typically shorter than in duration as a degree or does not require the same level of the general education or coursework. Uh, and a certificate can be issued by many uh, training providers, even within the organization, or some government institute can also issue, the, issue you the certificate. Uh, in case of uh, credentialing, the uh, verification process may be complex in some sense because it's usually given by a third party organization. Um, and that third party should be well known, recognized, uh, and it should be the uh, authorized one, you know, to give you in a specific field or expertise that um, provide you a proof that uh, that individual excellence or competence enough to give a quality service. And at the same time, there might be some um, criteria or requirements. For example, like um, level of education or, or what we call number of hours that you have been working in specific field. In terms of uh, credentialing, as I said, it's usually given by the third party and also by recognized uh, author authority, uh, which importantly is the one that should be should provide a proof that that individual have competence enough in that topic. So in short, you know, um, if I may say, certification is usually uh, kind of like general certificate. When uh, you have completed any courses or program at a certain level, I mean like if you have passed the post test, then you can get the certificate. Uh, to show that you are a capable person to perform your job. But credentialing is another level, uh, a kind of like um, a quality assurance that you can provide a job, a qualified job, and disseminate the quality service under your job. Um, this one I have already been said. Um, to provide you a little bit time frame of credentialing, uh, we can see that um, the process of credentialing actually it has been um, provided date back since uh, 1000 BC, and it's evolved from uh, what we call the the mouth of word, you know, the word of mouth, kind of like people remember that you are well known and you have repetition in some issues and you are well recognized by people and they keep talking about you. But then later it developed into the use of kind of like a diploma certificate or a letter of recommendations and later it become the electronic doc documentation. Anyway, throughout the long history of this one, uh, I'd like to show that all documentation is necessary for credentialing process. And as you know, you know, um, at the moment, the medical industry overall uh, has arrived the objective of uh, the real-time credential verification, and it's very much indeed right now. For modern technology, I mean, in, the, in later years, just as uh, in 1995 until present, we can see that almost all hospital 
we are using electronic version and all paper files are phased out. Uh, typically, most board of the United States use uh, the standards developed by the International Certification and uh, Repository uh, Consortium or IC and RC or NADAC. Uh, I have to say that before the WHO announced the global strategy in 2030, um, for the global plan, we have already formed the ACCE, or the Asian Center for Certification and Education of Addiction Professionals within our global plan. Uh, in order to respond to the long-standing uh, crisis of inadequate professionals and uh, evidence-based program. The ACCE actually focus on three uh, functions cover the curriculum development, training, and credentialing. And later in 2019, we developed the program to make it globally, and we call ourselves GCCC, or the Global Center for Credentialing and Certification. Uh, the mission of the GCCC uh, is to provide experience and training verification, and also we are doing appropriate exam to ensure that uh, governments and other employers are hiring and utilizing the most qualified professional to improve uh, positive outcome for individual, family, and community. We, we also encourage the national accreditation system. We encourage government to, um, to engage in the accreditation system at the country level. Uh, at the same time, we also continue our role of the curriculum development and training. We allowing GCCC to focus maintain on high standards and expanding the area of certification. And as uh, previously mentioned, the universal curricula was developed in terms of uh, international experts in the field of prevention, treatment, and recovery and support. Uh, for both uh, prevention, the identify, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, International Certified Addiction Professional or ICAP uh, for prevention, there must be at least six contact hours and six uh, ethic, six hours of ethic trainings. And the curricula covers uh, family based, school based, community based, workplace based. Environmental based and also media based. For um, treatment as well, we have four stage, four levels of ICAP exam, and um, this has been done through eight basic courses and fourteen advanced level courses. At the same time, we also have five specialized series. For um, this is a statistic that we have collected. International Certified Addiction Professionals now we cover uh, 78 countries worldwide and number of professionals as of June this year is already 2,343. Uh, there are many benefits of the credentialing. Even for individual, we can uh, have the self-improvement and also they can improve their own salary and advancement on their opportunity, and also they can improve their skills and ability for other patients. Uh, also, the health facility itself, we also have a lot of benefits on credentialing. Uh -huh. Especially uh, giving the higher standard and uh, competitive for hospital or the treatment care centers. So it proved that the standard of care among all these um, is the highest priority for the facility and for the nation. Uh, I'd like to end up my presentation by talking about a little bit about uh, future direction as the Colombo Plan, as the intergovernmental organization. So at the international level, um, the certification process uh, will be normally it's dynamic from country to countries. 
and it uh, should be complied with the international concept. And as I said, you know, country needs is very and must be understood with the um, certification process, how to, uh, how to make it success. And also, um, there is also a need to develop the environment, for example, like legal framework or institution to support and establish the certification network itself. And also at the international level, uh, the Cologne Plan also needs to work with member countries in order to enhance the quality assurance uh, and the need for improving the health workforce. So with this, um, I would like to thank you very, very much for your kind attention and hope I can clarify you a little bit on certification and credentialing that the Colombo Plan has doing so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, really, for this um, excellent introduction to the role of workforce development and credentialing for quality health care. And also, I think, congratulations to the work of the Colombo Plan that you have uh, done already and the growing number of um, credentialed professionals based on UTC and UPC. Congratulations. Um, with that, I would like to move to our next um, speaker. That's um, Elizabeth uh, Novakova. She's joining us um, from the Czech um, Republic, from Charles University, which I think is in Prague. And she's based at the Department of Addictology there as a junior researcher, as a preventionist and methodologist with a background in addictology studies and leadership in health and social services. Um, Elizabeth has a long-standing interest in the quality and continuous development of addiction services, striving to link insights from clinical practice with current scientific knowledge. And with that, very welcome. And the floor is yours, maybe. Clap hands also to welcome you. Thank you, Anya, for uh, for uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, Savadika, uh, I hope <laughs> this is uh, hello in in Thai. Uh, so my topic. Thank you. My topic today is quality assurance and quality management in DDR in uh, Czech Republic. And due to the limited time, I only have 10 minutes, I will cover the topic just briefly. But I am leaving a bunch of QR codes and links in my presentations for those who are interested and would like to go through the information uh, more deeply uh, later. Uh, although my presentation is more focused on uh, quality assurance uh, in the services, not so much in education, I, I hope it will uh, still be beneficial for some of you. For those who are not sure uh, about the position of Czech Republic on a world map, it's a small or middle-sized country in the heart of Europe with Prague uh, as uh, the capital city. Uh, so it's a pretty long uh, trip to, to get here and uh, if I get confused, I hope we can still blame uh, the jet lag. I would like to mention two projects uh, that are uh, about the topic of quality assurance that we've been involved in over for the last few years. And the first one is European project uh, with the acronym Phoenix uh, EU. Uh, the general aim of this project is to support implementation of quality standards in uh, all DDR areas uh, in practice across uh, European countries. And this project had uh, five ma main work packages. We were leading the third one, and uh, the aim was to detect uh, case, case studies of so-called good practice or promising practice of quality standards uh, implementation uh, and evaluate the, the forces, the barriers, the do's and don'ts in the process. Uh, we use questionnaires, uh, data analysis, interviews, and uh, other uh, procedures to obtain uh, as much data as possible. And uh, we also created a bunch of materials, such as methodology training for project partners, 
or selection criteria, evaluation criteria, and also a glossary of terms to unify the language because when speaking about the quality, we should get some kind of consensus what we are actually speaking about. And uh, although at the beginning we aim to get six to nine examples, we ended up uh, with 14 in total and uh, we offer the possibility to publish these case studies to the partners and more than half of them uh, actually did and I will get there in, in uh, next slides. So these are some tables from our research. Uh, in the selection uh, uh, process, we uh, wanted to obtain the diversity, uh, both geographically and especially in different DDR areas. And it was quite hard because many countries did implement some standards in prevention and treatment, but very few did in harm reduction area. Uh, the table shows uh, which countries, uh, after many rounds of evaluation and selection, uh, are those where we could find some examples of uh, QS implementation. We prepared a whole special issue of uh, peer review scientific journal Addictology. Uh, it's dedicated to the project activities and to those individual case studies. And the journal is open access, so those who are interested can find it uh, at the QR code provided or on the website of the, of the journal. I would also like to mention the website of the Phoenix project. Uh, you can find uh, all the information about the project, uh, the case studies, and soon uh, there will be also materials for supporting implementation and uh, video tutorials uh, that our colleagues prepared. And uh, I believe it can be uh, a great source of information on the topic. So uh, the participation in the project allowed us to uh, really reflect and evaluate uh, uh, the establishment and uh, development of the quality assurance uh, system uh, and quality management in our country. And in Czech Republic, you can say it's like a network with uh, main pillars in quality standards and certification process. Uh, in education and training or the, uh, of the workforce and uh, of course research and uh, getting the knowledge into the practice as well as uh, international co uh, cooperation and uh, professional network. We were able to detect key stages, events, projects that help uh, the implementation of quality assurance tools, especially standards of quality. And those standards for treatment and harm reduction are being developed since 1995, those for prevention since uh, 2005. Uh, thanks to pioneer work and uh, a strong voice of the professional community, and the fulfillment of the standards is uh, a prerequisite uh, when, uh, when you want to, uh, uh, to get a state subsidy. Uh, these standards do not reflect international or European standards before, because they were de developed earlier in time, but we have some plans for a future revision that include uh, adaptations as well. And last year, we also started to develop uh, clinical guidelines for uh, treatment, social reintegration, harm reduction, and recovery. And uh, of course, we are dealing with many difficulties that I'm sure you all know, especially uh, poor funding of the services for people who use drugs or the quite challenging dialogue between the various stakeholders who are involved in uh, drug policy. 
These are uh, examples of two articles we have published on the topic, one in that addictology journal I was speaking uh, about before, and the second one in the journal of substance use. And they reflect over 20 years uh, of the work in capacity building, service delivery, and quality assurance. Uh, so I think uh, it can be a good inspiration for those countries that are at the beginning uh, of the journey towards uh, quality, uh, good quality of services for people who use drugs. The Phoenix uh, project showed that uh, many countries are dealing with the same uh, or similar barriers and needs. Uh, of course, political support, clear, clear roles of, uh, uh, and competencies of the stakeholders and providers, uh, as well as education and training of the, of the workforce and the joint dialogue uh, are crucial for functional and sustainable quality assurance in uh, DDR. Uh, the second uh, project I would like to mention is, uh, has acronym WAVE and uh, it's also related to quality assurance uh, and it stands on the premise that uh, workforce education is crucial for uh, service quality and that uh, we need uh, skilled and resilient professionals. Uh, in this project, uh, we are leading the work package for, and the aim is to uh, map existing competency models and quality standards in the education and training of addiction professionals and associated uh, professions to create uh, the framework for high quality and sustainable education in the field. Okay, so thank you uh, for your attention and for this uh, possibility to be here and meet you all and share our uh, ideas and uh, experience. Uh, thank you. Um, so thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, also for this presentation, introducing us both to the Phoenix project of mapping of quality assurance in Europe and including the work in Czech Republic and then how it continues with the WAVE project and uh, on the workforce. So thanks so much, and I'm sure everybody will be happy to look up the articles that you presented. Just FYI, before I introduce the next speaker, that we will have time, I think, to take some questions in the end, right? So if you, to this speaker or the next speaker, have a question, please hold it. We will uh, allow some time at the end. So with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker. That's um, Dimitri Krupchanka. And uh, Dr. Krupchanka is a medical doctor specialized in psychiatry, psychotherapy, and addiction medicine with a master's in science degree in global mental health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he also holds a PhD in global health from the University of Geneva. Following many years of clinical practice in Belarus, Dr. Kruchampka worked as a senior researcher at the Department of Social Psychiatry at the National Institute of Mental Health, again in the Czech Republic. And in 2018, he joined the World Health Organization as a medical officer at the Alcohol, Drugs and Addictive Behaviors Unit in the Department of Mental Health and um, Substance Use. So with that, we are looking forward to hear from you, Dimitri Flosios. And Thank you very much, Anya, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for coming to this session. And uh, indeed, uh, I worked in Czech Republic, and it uh, was a pleasure also to hear the previous presentation. But now we let's switch from quality assurance in services and credentials to uh, work that WHO is now started on uh, competency-based education and mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. I have a couple of slides why, but I think in this audience you know that the burden of mental health substance use disorders is huge. There's just, you just see these figures, there's millions and millions of people with mental disorders, alcohol use disorder, drug use disorder, dementia, epilepsy, and more on top of that, there is a huge burden of comorbidity that uh, at least half or to 80% of people, they have two disorders at the same time. And uh, these all associated with huge mortality, one in 100 deaths globally due to suicide. In general, people with severe mental disorders die 10, 20 years earlier. 
huge amount of deaths. Uh, actually, there's a mistake. It's not 283 million deaths due to alcohol, 3 million deaths. I don't know how it happened. 283 million people with alcohol use disorders. About half million deaths due to drug use. And in general, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders together is the leading cause for years uh, lived with disabilities. It's one in four ILD globally. But at the same time, we all know here, but still I would like to highlight that the access to treatment remains very poor. Uh, and like with psychosis, about only one third of people receive treatment or even much less in low-income countries. Even in high-income countries, most people with depression don't receive care. Uh, you know, this is says one in five people with drug use, use disorders receive care, but I don't believe this number. I think it's much lower. And uh, also, if we look into how many of these people receive minimally adequate treatment, this number goes even lower. So for substance use disorders, we have about 7% based on global mental health uh, report data. And uh, human resources for mental neurological substance use are extremely limited. So here you see uh, different availability of different professionals per uh, 100,000 population. I wonder if you see my laser pointer, I try to use laser pointer. Um, even in high con countries, like there are only eight uh, or so psychiatrists per 100,000. Oh, let me switch to laser pointer. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. But you see these numbers in low income and low middle income countries are extremely low. Uh, I mean, we are here, we speak a lot about addiction medicine, addiction medicine professionals, but it's a dream for many countries. There is no even psychiatrist available for many people. Sometimes it's nurse or general healthcare practitioners. I mean, let's uh, not forget that the world is not only high-income countries, and uh, highly specialized workforce is very much needed, but in many countries it's not even basic health workforce available. So in um, WHO we collected uh, data through WHO survey on SDG 3.5. It's quite a complicated slide. I'm sorry for that, and you don't see details, so let me guide you quickly. So the first columns here is availability of different professionals. So like, let's look, psychiatrists. So 88% countries in our data report that they, they do have psychiatrists for treatment of substance use disorders. But at the same time, only in about 60% of these countries, there is continuing professional uh, development or education for them. And this, you see, across all specialties, the availability of professionals is higher than availability and access to education, to continue or to postgraduate. And for some specialties, it's extremely low. Like if you look at outreach health workers, it's like 26% countries have any uh, education for them post-service. Um, so altogether, access to education is very limited. And here I would like to mention pre and post uh, service education. Pre-service is education like undergrad, before people start providing services, right? And uh, in Double Chair Mental Health Atlas, uh, countries, only 45% countries reported availability of any pre-service education. So meaning that those doctors produced by universities, they do not have I don't even say competency, but knowledge in uh, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. So even if you produce a lot of specialized professionals and doctors don't have basic knowledge, like even asking basic questions about alcohol drug use, we will never reduce this gap. Uh, about one third countries uh, reported absence of any pre-service education. So meaning 45 reported availability, one third reported absence. So some countries are between the, these numbers. For in-service education or continuous or postgraduate, uh, in our data, 60% countries reported availability of in-service, continuous or postgraduate education. But as I showed, for substance use disorders, it a lot depends on specialty. So like if you come back, you see like for psychiatrists it's quite high, for psychologists it's high, but addiction medicine professionals, only 29% have continuous, about 20, 26% uh, post-graduate education. And uh, in about 10 countries, there are no educational programs in the area of substance use at all, neither pre nor pre, uh, no in-service education. 
And another problem is that even if there are some educational programs, the variability in content, in quality, in um, uh, delivery methods is huge, in, incomprehensible, and it's sometimes really difficult to compare between them. Now let me move uh, a bit to workforce development. There has been a paradigm, paradigm shift in uh, recent decades, I would say, from individual worker approach. So it was previous, like maybe 40 years ago, that we just train individuals. So now, and it's reflected in Lancet Commission on, uh, on Human uh, Workforces for Health, that the system, uh, that, that we need not the individual worker training, but we need an integrated human service system approach. So we need to not just train people, but have integrated training into ongoing sustainable curricula. Uh, and also we need to provide competence-based education. I'll tell later what is competence-based. And I'm happy that uh, uh, Oranush mentioned the WHO Global Strategy on Human Resources for Health, and actually this strategy provides this broader perspective about not just training, but also it speaks about employment, job placement, environment, and many other things. Now, uh, the, this global strategy highlights the need for competency-based education in health. And what is competency-based education? Is when people uh, receive education that allows them to use the knowledge and skills in the context of practice they are doing. So it's not just I know psychopathology, but I know how to talk to person, how to understand what's happening and what I do. So it's much more focused on practice activities than on the theoretical knowledge gained. So there are different ways how to uh, evaluate it. So the WHO also provides this global competency and outcomes framework for universal health coverage. It basically speaks about four levels that person knows, person knows how, person shows how, and person does. And the evaluation can be done at all these four levels. So ideally, we need people to know how to do things, not to know things. And uh, in line with this strategy, WHO has been producing competency-based tools. There's one for universal health coverage, one for eye care, uh, one for refugees and migrant health, uh, one for rehabilitation in health. So there's been a range of tools already produced. And, and more are coming. So for self-care, competency standards for self-care coming, uh, well, they were supposed to come July, some delays. Uh, competence and outcomes framework for essential public health functions, which is also interesting. And apparently we feel and we have requests from countries and partners to also look at the field of mental neurological substance use disorders. And then we initiated two parallel projects. One on pre-service education for mental neurological substance use disorders, so it's not only addiction, right? And I think it makes sense that uh, doctors should know also on depression, on psychosis, all these things together. But also on continuous education in substance use disorders. So the vision of these two parallel projects is that we go from train and hope approach, like we train and hope that something changes, to a system of continuous improvements uh, and uh, acquisition of required competencies that people are able to implement activities that they need to. So, as I said, two projects, one on pre-service education and uh, one for in-service education. So what has been the progress so far? So for pre-service education, we did uh, mapping and literature review, so we collated resources that we could identify in the public domain but we are still looking for resources, and I will mention it in the end. We did quite extensive expert consultations. There was a meeting uh, shaping the context of this tool, and we already have a first draft. For the core competence framework for substance use disorders, we just started. Uh, this pre-service went much faster, but we are already now at the stage of mapping and, coll and collating resources. And I need to hear from you, from your university and your country, what is available, what are curriculum, what are competency-based frameworks you have. Uh, I'll tell this in the end. So now let's focus on just pre-service. So the process have been scoping literature review, not many papers identified, like 33 papers, 13 curriculums. We did 45 key informant interviews. There was a global meeting in Geneva, global expert group meeting, and as I said, the first draft. Uh, shortly, there are so many problems we identified through the literature. They related to content. 
So the curriculums uh, existing, they're so much theoretically oriented with lack of practical experience, lack of attention to practice activities. There are many didactic approaches, and again, not participatory approach to training. There are too many theoretical backgrounds. You know, there's one country prefers psychopathology approach, another country prefers screen brief intervention approach. So there are different theoretical frameworks which make it difficult even to compare. Content is mainly focused on psychiatry, or diagnostic, and pharmacology with very little attention to psychosocial intervention. And we didn't find anything on public health for general health practitioners. Substance use or addiction either completely excluded or covered very superficially. Of course, there is a huge problem with consistency. The heterogeneity is very high. So the content, the structure, the duration, the scope, there are so many differences that there is, we didn't find any standardized approaches to uh, core competencies for pre-service education and mental health. And uh, so basically, it's even impossible to compare the uh, available documents. There are a lot of challenges at the, for the planning and delivery of this education. So of course, the resources are limited. And the thing is that even if resources are available, they are short-term available. So it's just somebody funds the development of curricula, but there is no fund for, to really make it work, to implement it. Uh, another problem, the curricula already overloaded for, I mean, there are doctors here, you remember your sleepless nights, right? Uh, during first, second, and well, for me, well, three first years were the most uh, difficult. So then uh, another challenge, that university administration is resistant. So they, they not always endorse the mental health uh, component in the curriculum. There are also issues with territorialism, like different disciplines always try to promote their agenda. Um, Another problem that there is lack of clinical sites to practice skills, especially for for uh, general education, for pre-service education. So during the rotations, sometimes there is no good mental health services that students could experience. So it's either in some cases just inpatient mental hospitals, uh, which also have some kind of biased uh, image of mental health. Uh, Trainers themselves, and I think that uh, uh, Carmel mentioned yesterday for nurses that there is not enough equipped professionals to provide this training. Uh, another problem, students were targeted only if they intended to become psychiatrists. So if you want to become psychiatrists, you can get more attention. But if you want to become gynecologists, then nobody really pays much attention to you. Very limited assessment. Often it's uh, the questions on mental health not included in final exam, and when measured, uh, some studies that show that competencies were not achieved, even if knowledge gained. So a person knows more, but there is no guarantee that it leads to the better practice. And in general, there is a lack of uh, research and evaluation on effectiveness of these competency frameworks or curriculums. But also there are positive news. It seems that pre-service education is emerging in low and middle income countries. Now it's mainly what we have found is image gap based, it's WHO image gap tool. And uh, so these research, uh, they even evaluated. So integration into country curricula, implementation and measurement. Uh, when this project, the curricula and competencies uh, implemented and measured, it shows that actually the mental health literacy increases. Uh, students are more confident to approach and deal mental neurological substance use disorders, and they demonstrate better attitude and less stigma. We also found that there are a couple of facilitators, like extremely important, that faculty and universities endorse the, uh, this work, and uh, that there are active teaching team that support the skills. Now, uh, we had a meeting in December last year in Geneva, actually, this representative of several universities came together and advised us what can be done. So they formulated principles for this pre-service education that should be evidence-based, connected to existing resources, globally relevant, practical, illustrative, accessible, collaborative, and person-centered. The, we shaped the, 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 formulated the purpose. The purpose would be to provide practical guidance so it's not just a set of uh, competencies, but it's to provide guidance on how to develop and implement pre-service education. Um, maybe I'll skip a couple of slides for the time. So we already have draft of the content, and I think the most important thing here is this, this is going to be a guide. So it's not just a set of competencies. So there will be also guidance on 
how you uh, implement it, how you assess current situation, and how you measure implementation. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you don't see anything here, but just to show that we already have a set of these competencies across areas, mental health, substance use disorders, happy to share those interested. But also there are many challenges. So the, there are inconsistent definition of competencies across sectors and organizations. So like in harm reduction kind of networks, they see it the one way, in treatment prevention sometimes different way. The, uh, another huge problem is that roles vary across countries. So for example, in some countries, nurses, they have prescriptive power. In other countries, they don't. Uh, and so the, the question is, should these competencies be like based on occupational roles or rather practice requirements or like levels of care provision? Uh, of course, huge problem that programs are already overloaded and there are not enough uh, training uh, educators who could implement them. And there are huge ca ca contextual and cultural differences in approaching mental health. So now the next steps for both of these uh, parallel, as I said, projects. We want to continue work on this pre-service and we still plan to do technical working group that people can look at this guide we have, provide their feedback, share the experience they have in countries and universities. And then we are also looking for universities that are interested then to pilot it, adapt and pilot and potentially implement. Similar plans for the core competency framework for more specialized workforce, but uh, we are a bit behind the, the pre-service education. And there we still at the stage of expert consultation and we want to hear from you. So one, the main reason I'm here is basically to know what universities have and to see if there are partners who are interested to collaborate, to share experience, to pilot and implement these things. And I would welcome you to scan this QR code, send us your, there are a couple of questions there, and you provide your email, so we have lists of those people who are interested, and then we want to hear from you what you have, what are the needs in your universities, and uh, how you're interested in piloting and implementation. I also have same QR code in this handouts on table, so if you didn't scan it, no worries, you can find it on the table. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Dimitri, for walking us through on one side kind of the gap in specialized workforce, including obviously for substance use, the strategies on competency-based educations, and then, you know, maybe where the future will go, the development of core competencies for substance use disorders. Thanks so much. Um, with that, we still have a little bit of time. Um, I'm honestly not sure how we make it with the microphones, but we have an extra microphone that we could share. Maybe I'll move down here. So that's on, so let's take, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Valentine from Namda Zikyo University, Oka. Thank you for the last, the last presenter, but I think I would want to submit something because Many of us research scientists from Global South and Sub-Saharan Africa has always argued that MNS workforce is not only Western-oriented. There are traditional healers in Sub-Saharan Africa that does work that is similar and comparable in evidence-based practice with the workforce you've presented. There are, there are faith-based relationships in Sub-Saharan Africa that has done good jobs in area of mental health rehabilitation. So I submit that WHO PSE may be revised in context to what is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. I also submit that PSE training should incorporate some element of traditional healing that has been shown to be evidence-based so that we can have a global discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe we take one or two more questions, if there are, and maybe the speakers to take note of, which might be for them. There is one other question. Microphone is coming. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Just a little addendum to what he said. And I'm speaking in the capacity of uh, being part of the ICUDDR uh, Africa uh, person. Um, from what he has said, I think uh, uh, WHO needs to incorporate some of the literatures that abound in Africa, or, you know, or sub -sub -sub -Af Saharan Africa and other countries that may not be available online. I think that's one thing. Because uh, we, uh, we need to recognize the fact that we have a problem of uh, access to structures of social media, internet, and all of these things. But there are scholars that actually have a lot of evidence-based literatures that World Health Organization need to recognize and add. And then for my friend in Czech, that was a good work. But I quickly checked the Journal of Addictology. It happens not to be online. If there's something that needs to be done, I'm really interested in it. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll take these two comments. Well, there's one more, and then uh, let's give the speakers a chance to respond. Uh, my name is Naveed Sultan, and I am from Pakistan. And I am not let, uh, linked to any university. But uh, we, have a, uh, we are the practitioner, we are running a clinic, and uh, we have a rehabilitation center. In our association, we are the 600 psychologists. Those are working inside uh, Pakistan. So how we can uh, connect with this uh, training and how we can educate our team? Thank you. For the questions, I think there were, and we'll come back if we have time to another round. So there were at least two for Dimitri and one for Elizabeth, I think. Maybe you want to start. So I would like to acknowledge the role of traditional healers, not only in Africa, but in many countries they play a tremendous role. Also in India, uh, and, and not only providing services, but sometimes providing support to families and communities. And uh, I mean, you can't treat mental health problem just in person. You need to look at the community, the family, and traditional healers provide this relief. This is very important. Uh, and. Uh, what I presented today, it's, it's a medical education, so you are right, it's, we are not focused in this particular presentation on traditional healers, but the role of traditional healers is recognized not only in mental health, but in general in health. It's even mentioned in one of the World Health Assembly resolution. But I should tell you, we can't do everything at the same time. So now we focus on pre-service education in medical area. So it doesn't even, um, so I should have tell, told this, we don't look at psychology, so we are now focused on um, at medical education only. So not nurses, probably not psychologists, mainly doctors. Yeah. So then, um, I also I that's wonderful comments indeed. The literature from not only Africa but from many countries it's extremely difficult to find because it's not an academic journals, it's somewhere at governmental, even websites, so, and on local languages, you need to really dig there, and you need to pay somebody to spend a lot of time to find this. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm interested if you can share what you know, uh, or if you can ask some other colleagues to provide additional, like curricula, what's, what's, what's the education in your country, so that's for sure. And uh, for psychologists, I said that now we don't really look at the psychologist level, mm -hmm. but I think that psychologists can also benefit from um, this project. And I think that for your question, we don't provide direct training uh, in this project, but we have ImageGap tool and ImageGap related training materials which you can take. There's even training manual with slides, with everything which you can use for your purposes in your center. And it covers not only substance use, but all mental health disorders, dementia, epilepsy, depression. I can share with you. Thank you. And there was one on the journal. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to reflect on your brilliant comment and maybe I should have included it in my presentation because that was a um, big issue during uh, Phoenix EU projects that we realized not many countries provide the information in uh, English or some other language, uh, but main, mainly it's just in national language. Uh, it's the same for Czech Republic. Uh, so that was a big issue. But I overheard your question about addictology. Uh, did you catch it? What was? Journal. Journal. Yes, it's online. And uh, I think
okay maybe because of my interest i quickly went to it uh, so if it's something you have access some of us it's not online it's not available uh huh uh, that's weird because it should, but but m maybe we can look at it maybe later mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you we'll check that and i think there were at least one or two more questions which maybe we can take before then uh, we close and uh, I will remind you of the evaluation of the session. I think one question was at least here. Anybody else? Okay, and then maybe second question there and then I think we will close, but the speakers will be available afterwards. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I is me, uh, Salman, Professor of Clinical Psychology at the Institute of Clinical Psychology, University of Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, I'm quite interested to know about the, the pro protocols and the guidelines uh, which has been developed by WHO. Uh, in, in country where uh, I belong to the academia, mostly in the clinical practice with the uh, service level providers, both the mental health as well as for the substance abuse. Uh, out of 244 universities in Pakistan, uh, this is the only institute, my institute, we have uh, implemented the substance abuse uh, prevention and treatment program and a postgraduate diploma in addiction sciences, the first ever program in Pakistan. Unfortunately, when we are trying to, to collaborate with the, the uh, service providers, with this uh, service level, the problem we are facing is the following the guidelines by the UNODC as well as the WHO guidelines and the protocol which has been developed. We are mostly following the guidelines by the WHO as well as the API guidelines. When we are sending our trainees for the externship programs at the service level, unfortunately the protocols and the guidelines are not followed by the practitioners or the owners of the service provider who are the business-minded and they are not following those guidelines. How to, how to create a synergy and integrate both at the academia as well as those who are the service provider to create a synergy and it, in order to integrate these guidelines and the protocols. Thank you so much. And then the last question was there. Thank you so much for the presentation. We are from Indonesia and we're really interesting with uh, your work, Dimitri, from WHO because we are still struggling with the certain competencies between uh, every step, I mean for medical doctor and then psychiatrist and uh, addiction psychiatrist and internal medicine, we are still struggling about it. So uh, maybe we are working for 10 years and there are still no uh, absolute curriculum for every uh, step of the physician. So uh, maybe with this uh, guideline, uh, we can uh, contribute and also uh, getting better with our uh, curriculum. Thank you so much. Yeah, very quickly. But I think these questions just represent what I showed, that the, even if trainings exist, the competencies and uh, uh, kind of implementation of guidelines and evidence-based interventions is limited. So maybe we're doing something wrong with education. Maybe we need to step back, look what are the core things we want people to really know how to implement in their practice. So this is a quick comment. Thank you so much with this. And maybe we can have the slide on the evaluation up. Um, so then uh, I really would like to thank all the speakers again. I think we learned a lot about existing efforts on quality also in the area of workforce development. We learned about the challenges. Yes, clap hands. <laughs> and I think also big thanks to everybody in the room because as you've heard kind of, you know, we all need to learn also from you and all your experiences contributing to the discussion and in the end to the actual work. So thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the conference and please do not forget to evaluate this session. Okay, thank you.